Good morning, everyone. Would everyone please stand for opening prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you, and Lord, thank you that you have given us your word, our guidebook. Uh, without it, we'd be lost because we would never know about you. We'd never know the truths. And we just pray this morning as we go through 2 Timothy, Lord, and we look at how all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Help us to take these things to heart. Help us to treasure it, not to let people cause us to doubt it, but to understand that these are your words to us. Lord, we pray for worship this morning. Lord, may these songs honor you. And Lord, may our hearts and minds be focused upon you so we can receive from you this morning. Bless those that are here, those that are listening on the radio, the internet. Just draw them close to you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Morning, everyone. If we could open our Bibles this morning, please. We are going to read from Psalm 32 today. We're told, Blessed he is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old, though my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble and you shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. May sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice your righteousness and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Amen. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3 as we continue our in-depth study of Paul's second letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. And this is an important study because the focus here is the Word of God, the Bible. And I'm not saying that other parts of the Bible are not important, but if you begin to doubt that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, then the other parts of the Scripture you're going to doubt. And then it's up to you what you believe and don't believe. And many have gone that route today. You know, I've called our study this morning All Scripture, and you'll see why as we go through this study. You know, I was listening to, and I don't know why I do this, but I do, you know, to a Facebook post about a, a woman pastor who was saying that, you know, she doesn't agree with all that Paul said and what he wrote. Well, I'm really sorry if you don't agree with what Paul wrote, but I don't agree with what you're saying because it goes contrary to the scriptures. Paul just didn't write things down. Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we'll see that this morning. These are not just, hey, these are my ideas, I feel this is right. Uh, and we'll look at that as we study the scriptures. And, you know, I, I, I think we can understand why skeptics uh, come and put down the Bible, um, because you know, they don't believe it. They don't believe that God inspired this book. They say that no one knows the author of the Bible. Well, I do. It's God. The Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures. And, you know, it's amazing how much they attack something that they don't believe. 
isn't it? You know, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in the Bible, and yet you spend so much time telling us that you don't believe it. Hey, just let it go. You know, if what they're saying is true, that the Bible is not the inspired word of God, that it's not given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, well, then none of it's true. There's no Jesus, there's no sin, there's nothing we can put our trust in regarding the Bible. It's a bunch of stories. And obviously that's not true, and we'll see that as we go through our study this morning. But if you think about it, if you believe that way, then you're in a pretty hopeless situation. What are you going to put your trust in? Where is your hope in this life and the one to come based upon? And you say, well, you know, Pastor Joe, what do you believe? Well, I believe the Bible. What do you, why do you believe what you believe? You've put your faith in absolutely nothing. And what you believe ends up being a fairy tale. I told you before, years ago, there was this uh, group in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I know why they picked Scottsdale, because it's a very rich area. It's a beautiful area to live in in Arizona. And uh, they were called the Eternal Flame. And the whole premise was that you never die unless you want to die. This is a great premise. They became very rich because people were leaving their families and moving out to Scottsdale, taking all their money and possessions and giving it to the leaders. And one of the questions was asked, well, what happens if you're walking out into the street and get hit by a bus and you die? I said, well, you wanted to get hit by the bus and die. Well, how do you deny that? You can't. Of course, if they died, it was because they wanted to die. You can't ask them, did you want to get hit by the bus? Well, they're no longer around, but God's word is still around. What's happened is so many people are coming out today, especially with social media, getting us to doubt God's word. Many people are believing it. They're believing these lies. There's a record low of 20% of Americans say that the Bible is the literal word of God. The last time I was checked was 2017, and it was 24% then. That's horrible. 87 or 80 some percent of Americans claim, Americans claim to be Christian. 20% believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Wow. 29% of Americans say the Bible is a collection of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. It's the first time that more people say that the Bible is fables and legends and so on than those that believe it's the literal word of God. It's inspired by God. And because of this, because I think it's so important, we're going to take a couple of weeks looking at 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. This morning, we're going to look at all Scripture. Next week, it'll be the Old Testament text. Next week, the New Testament text, showing why we can trust this. And here's the problem. If without the authority of the Scriptures, what do you have? You have the authority of man. And thus, man makes the rules, man tells you what you can and can't do, and man tells us the way to God, the way to heaven. And it's a big deal. A church that is without the authority of the scriptures, a church that negates the scriptures or the word of God, is like a crocodile without teeth. You know what? It can open its mouth really wide. It can mouth, open its mouth often. But who really cares if it has no teeth, right? What's it going to do, gum you to death? I don't know. Don't take the teeth away from God's word. Don't negate what God has said. And I think, you know, that's why the church today can make all kinds of noise, but no one really seems to care anymore because the church has negated the word of God. The world doesn't even want to hear us anymore because there's no authority in what they're saying. They've lost their teeth. And... For those of you who have been around for the 29 years that I've been here, you know what I believe about the Bible. I teach it from Genesis through Revelation. Yeah, it takes us a long time. It takes us about 15 years or so. But if I didn't believe it, why would I teach it? You know, it's not like I get all kinds of fame and notoriety being a pastor here, right? 
That's not what it's about. It's about teaching the word of God. And if I didn't believe it, I would be gone. What's the point? Am I passionate about the word of God? Absolutely. Absolutely, I'm very passionate about it. That's because I believe it's God's word. And we are seeing in the church today the separation between those that believe in the authority of the scriptures and those who reject it. Those uh, for, that reject it, for the most part, end up being apostate because they move so far away from God and the authority of the scriptures. You can't pick and choose what you like and you don't like. I mean, we've all heard of the continental divide, right? Water that flows on one side of the continental divide uh, flows for the most part into the Atlantic Ocean. Water that flows on the other side of the continental divide, the Pacific Ocean. And here's the thing. Once water starts going down one side, there's no turning back. Its outcome is determined. It will reach the destination from which it's flowing. And the same is true with errancy, or that the Bible has errors in it, and inerrancy, the Bible has no errors in it. Depending on what you believe regarding the Word of God will determine where you end up. And my prayer as we go through these studies is that you would leave here totally confident that what you have in your hands, the Bible, is the inerrant, inspired Word of God from Genesis through Revelation. I think it's that important. And I've broken these verses down, in, this is in your bulletin, into three main points. From God, in 2 Timothy 3.16a, is profitable, 2 Timothy 3.16, and the end result in 2 Timothy 3.17. So let's pick up 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, and let's see what the Lord has for us this morning as we study his word, and we look at this topic, all scripture. And that's what Paul starts out with here. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is our battle today. The inspiration of the scriptures of the Bible, is it from God? And why is it such a battle? Because many are rejecting it. What they end up saying is it contains the word of God, but not every passage is from God. And they change this verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. They change it to all scripture that is inspired by God or all scripture inspired by God. Is there a difference? Yeah, it's a huge difference. All scripture is given by inspiration to all scripture that is inspired by God. What they are saying is there are parts that are from God and there are parts that are not from God. Do you see how that one little word changes everything? They're getting us to doubt the scriptures. By doing that, they're really being dishonest to the text. But think about this. If the Bible or all scripture that is inspired by God, if we believe that, then we've opened a can of worms. What do I mean by that? How do you know which is inspired by God and which is not inspired by God? You see, the Bible is worthless then. Why? Because what you determine to be of God may be different from what I determine to be of God. And I'll tell you, I'm going to pick all the things that say that Jesus loves everyone and it's, he's real nice. You'll do that too. I don't think any of you will pick the judgment of God, will you? No, no one picks that. So those aren't inspired by God about the judgment and wrath of God, no. Jesus is a God of love and accepts everyone and like all dogs go to heaven, all people go to heaven. Well, yeah, that's not true. You know, here's the thing. Can the words of men transform a person's life? No, the words of God can. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me. Paul wrote in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and it's powerful. And it's sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Yeah, exactly. It cuts right to the heart of the matter. Isn't it interesting as you're dealing with an issue in your life, and you go to church and 
the pastor's teaching on that, like someone called him up and said, hey, you know, deal with this issue because so-and-so is having a problem. That's not how it works. Or you turn on the radio station, and every pastor is talking about the thing you're going through. You're like, this isn't fair. Oh, it's very fair because God knows your heart, and he knows what you need to hear, and he's cutting that garbage out. Praise God that he cares that much for you. The Word of God transforms our lives. It's plain and simple. simple. Now, people do say God's Word is just symbolic. It's just a bunch of stories. Well, if that's true, then you have to determine what those stories mean, right? And we'll all come up with different ideas. And then we make the Bible say what we want it to say instead of what God is speaking forth. And I'll just make this really simple regarding the Word of God and what God has to say about it. I want you to think about this. Listen carefully because this, we could probably all go home after this, okay? But don't because I still have more to say. <laughs> Psalm 138.2, listen to this. David wrote, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Oh, what's so important about that? This, David is saying that God has placed his word above his name and his name is all that he is. It speaks of who he is, his whole being. He's placed his, name, his word above his name. And that means if we don't, can't trust God's word, if this is not from God, then we can't trust God because he's nothing. You can't trust his word, you can't trust him. Do you see how important this is? And that's why we're going to take a few weeks looking at this topic of the Bible and seeing why we can trust it. Again, Paul said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that idea given by inspiration of God speaks of God-breathed. Now, some would argue and say, well, Paul was speaking about Timothy's conversion to Christ that he spoke of prior to these verses and how the Holy Scriptures brought him to saving faith and made him wise for salvation. So when Paul is speaking of all Scripture, he's speaking of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and only that. But here's the thing. We've got to look at how this is written. If Paul meant the exact same thing here as what Timothy learned as a child, he might have said those Scriptures, speaking of what Timothy learned from, Right? Or he might have just repeated the exact phrase, holy scriptures. But he doesn't. Paul didn't say that. He said all scripture. Because he recognized that what God was going to speak forth through the apostles and prophets was also going to be scripture. It was God-breathed. In fact, Paul in Ephesians 2.20 said, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You see, our faith is built upon God's word. The apostles and prophets laid down this foundation that we build our faith upon. And keep in mind, when Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, not all the scriptures were written yet. They were coming together. But Paul's not just speaking about the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures from Genesis and ultimately through the book of Revelation he's talking about. In fact, I'll show you. 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul quotes out of the Gospel of Luke, and you know what he calls it? Scripture. In 2, Timothy, or 2 Peter 3.16, Peter tells us that Paul's writings are part of Scripture. And it's the entire Bible, the Word of God. Every single word in the Bible is there because God wanted it there, and there are no exceptions. Now, I know some would argue that point. This statement really doesn't mean anything, Pastor Joe, because it's self-referential. Anyone could write a book and say it's inspired by God, right? Anyone can. It's true. God says it's self-referential because he speaks it forth. And Here's the thing, if God didn't say that, that the words were inspired by him, critics would argue there's nothing in the Bible that says it was inspired by him. So it's kind of a you know, no-win situation here. If you don't want to believe, you're not. 
But let's look at the evidence here. Some would argue that this book was written a long time ago and passed on from generation to generation, so there must be many errors in the Bible. It can't be accurate. You know, think about it. You know, when we did the prayer chain, not emails, but when we called people on the phone, you know, call up, say, so-and-so is having their appendix removed on such and such a date, and by the time it got to the last person, so-and-so is having a baby on next week. You know, it's just crazy how the story changes, right? And so they attribute that to the Bible, and they say, well, yeah, I mean, look at the thousands of years. It has to be, have many years in it. But let's look at what the Bible is, the history of it. It was written over some 500-year time span. More than 40 authors, authors from all walks of life, kings the peasants wrote it. Three different continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe. Three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. A variety of literary styles. It addresses hundreds of controversial subjects, and yet there's harmony there. And it's the unfolding story of God's love for sinful, sinful man. And not only that, but prophetically speaking, it's awesome because what God has said would take place has or it will. You know, God doesn't just make predictions. We can look and see if they've come to pass. There's over 300 prophecies of Christ's first coming. All of them were fulfilled down to the tiniest detail. I mean, we were told in the Old Testament that the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem of Ephratah and his goings forth were from everlasting. We just read that and go, well, that's a Christmas passage. No, that's a prophetic passage written hundreds of years before the birth of Christ saying that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem of Ephratah. There were two Bethlehems. So this is very specific. And Bethlehem was a hick town. It was a small town. It wasn't a big city. It wasn't like Jerusalem. Who, what king would come? The Messiah is going to come from this little hick town? Yes. But this child is not just any child that's going to be born there. His going forths are from everlasting. In other words, that Hebrew word means from beyond the vanishing point. This child that is to be born in Bethlehem is eternal. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Wow. When the wise man came, so they were led by the star. They went to Herod. And what did Herod do when he was trying to find out where this king was to be born? He went to the Jewish religious leaders. And they told him in Bethlehem. Why? Because they knew the scriptures. It didn't cause them to go to Bethlehem to see their king. But they knew where the king was to be born. You know, again, people will argue there are many errors there has to be in the text. Well, you got to look at the facts. The New Testament alone, we see not more than one one-thousandth of the text is in question and not one significant doctrine is in question. Keep in mind, we don't have the original writings. These are copies, okay? And we'll deal more when we get to the Old Testament text and the New Testament text to show you how accurate they are. But one one-thousandth of the text is in question in the New Testament. And some of these are just related to spelling errors. If there's a spelling error, that's a, an error, okay? But it doesn't change the context of the text, and it's amazing. The Old Testament text is no different. And I want you to see how accurately the Old Testament scriptures have been preserved. When we compare the scroll of Isaiah, and we'll deal more with this next time, it was found in a cave in the Qumran community back in 1947, and it dates to 100 BC. The next text from Isaiah is from 916 AD. As we look at those 1,292 verses, or 37,044 words, the text, or the integrity of the text, holds up over a thousand year time span. 95% of the text is identical, and the 5% variation were mostly variations in spelling, and it didn't change the context on the text one bit. That scroll is 24 feet long. You can go to Israel and see it today. 
It's an amazing scroll. But what about the New Testament? We have over 24,000 manuscript copies of the New Testament in existence today. 5,300 known Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin Vulgate manuscripts, 9,300 other early versions of manuscripts of the New Testament. The New Testament has about 20,000 lines of text, and, that, and of that, only 40 lines or 400 words of the New Testament are in doubt. And of that, only about 1 60th can be called substantial variations. That would give us a text that is approximately 98% perfect, pure. Think about this for a minute. The New Testament is not based upon one scripture. It's based on the totality. So we can check things out in other portions of the scripture. 40 lines, 400 words of the New Testament's 20,000 lines are in doubt. And F.F. F. Bruce, who's a New Testament scholar, said, the variant readings about which any doubt remains affect no material question of historical fact or of Christian faith and practice. Can we trust it? Yeah. This is from a non-Christian publication, not from Christian writers. Back in Time Magazine, back when Time Magazine actually put forth news, this is December 30th, 1974. And they said, after more than two centuries of facing the heaviest scientific guns that could be brought to bear, the Bible has survived and is perhaps better for the siege. Even on the critics' own terms, historical fact, scriptures seem more acceptable now than they did when the rationalists began the attack. So what Time Magazine is saying is, man, you can look at the historical evidence for the Bible and it there's proof all over the place. And as these critics came to attack the Bible, what ended up happening is the Bible is more sure than when they first started the attack. Good luck finding any magazine or news reporter who would say something like that today, right? They're not interested in that. They want to disprove the scriptures. Why? Because Jesus is very narrow-minded. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. People don't like that. We have to repent of our sins and come to that saving faith in Jesus. They don't like that. What we have here, guys, in our hands is the word of God, and we can trust it. It's truth. I don't know. Years ago, there were some pictures of um, Bibles being handed out in China because you know, China's... Not, does not like Bibles. And these people that were getting, they were tearing, because they didn't have enough Bibles, they were tearing pages out and handing them to one another, and they were holding them to their heart. Why? Because they believe this is the Word of God. Do we treasure God's Word like that? Man. It's truth. Now, there are those that could say, well, you know, anyone can write a book and say that it's inspired by God. Please do. Go ahead. Give it a try. Let's see how you do. Right? Write something that's inspired, that compares to the Bible. I'll even leave out the Old Testament, just something like the New Testament. Write it out. With prophecy, with the ability to change lives, not just outwardly, but inwardly. And that's manifested then in their outward actions. You see... They're not going to be able to do it because they're human. God knows all things. Think about what he wrote or inspired these writers to write thousands of years ago applies to our lives today. Wow. Look at the people. You know, Voltaire. I, I love Vol I don't love Voltaire, but I love how things worked out. He said Christianity and the Bible would be done within 100 years of his death. The Geneva Bible Society bought his house and printed Bibles from his house. God has a sense of humor, guys. He does have a sense of humor. The critics today, professors, whoever, 
Are you smarter than a Galilean fisherman 2,000 years ago? You have all the qualifications, all the culture, the brain power necessary. It should be easy for them to do this, but they're not going to be able to. Why? Because these men were inspired by God. Again, these are not their writings. This is inspiration by God. In fact, Peter talks about that, and we'll deal with that. But he says, what I saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, God's word is more sure than what I saw with my eyes. Yeah. These guys, over thousands of years, write a, have written a, the story of God's love for sinful man. And it's one unfolding story. It's inspired. And I know people will doubt it, but I'll give you an example. The Gospel in the Old Testament. There's a couple places we could see that, but uh, in the book of Genesis, I'll share this one with you, because way back in Genesis chapter 5, God put this together. There's no way man could have done this. In Genesis chapter 5, probably a section people don't really, it's not something that they'll memorize. It's not memory verses for them, but it's the genealogy from Adam onward, and their names play a very important role in this picture. Adam means man. Seth approved. Enos or Enosh, subject to death. Canaan, sorrowful. Mahaliel, from the presence of God. Jared, one comes down. Enoch, dedicated. Methuselah, dying he shall send. Lamech, to the poor and lonely. And Noah, rest in comfort. God devoted a whole chapter to these men who begot and were begone, or they died. And this is how it plays out. Listen carefully. The man approved to death, sorrowful. From the presence of God, one comes down dedicated. Dying, he shall send to the poor and lonely rest and comfort. Wow. That's the gospel message given thousands of years before Christ came. Adam, man sinned, and the death process began, and man was sorrowful because he was separated from God. But God came down, the incarnation, and died for our sins. He died for the poor and lonely, and in his death, he brought rest and comfort to man because now man has been reconciled to God. That's amazing. And I'll give you one more just because I love this stuff. Genesis chapter 22, Abraham is going to offer his, God tells Abraham to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And Abraham is a type of God the Father. Isaac was a type of the Lord. And we know that God did not allow Abraham to do this, but we're told when Isaac asked his father where the sacrifice was, Abraham responded, and this is, this is in the <clears throat> New King James Version. It says, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. I don't think that's a correct translation. The complete Jewish Bible puts this verse like this, and I think this is correct, and I think the King James Version has it correct. It says, Abraham replied, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. That's what we see in the gospel. God became flesh, dwelt among us, went to the cross of Calvary to pay for our sins, and rose from the grave on the third day. It's the gospel message. Jesus is the lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. And it's interesting because as you read that story, it says Abraham came down. No. Well, what happened with Isaac? Is he still up on the mountain? No, Isaac came down. What the Holy Spirit did was a little editing. He only said that Abraham came down. We see, we don't see Isaac anymore. Not yet. But we see Abraham, as God the Father, send his servant Eliezer, the comforter, to go and get a bride for his son, Isaac. What's the Holy Spirit doing today? The Holy Spirit is getting a bride for Jesus. The Father has sent the Holy Spirit to do that. The next time we see Isaac is when he meets his bride. The next time we see Jesus is when we go to meet our bride, right? 
Is that amazing? You know, how did man, how could man do something like that? They can't. This is the inspiration of God. And that's what I love about this. So as we looked at the scriptures, we see, man, they, they are from God. They have to be. But what's so important about it? Why is it such a big deal? Because Paul talks about it next. The scriptures are profitable to us. Look at verse 16 again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness. All scripture, again, is given by inspiration of God from Genesis through Revelation. The Holy Spirit moved these men to write these words down. In fact, in John 14, 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Jesus is telling his men, look, the Holy Spirit is going to give you these words. And you're going to write them down. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, look at the details. Each writer is a little different, but they tell us this, they're telling us the same story. And does the Holy Spirit bring to remembrance to us the things we've studied? Absolutely. But we don't have new revelations from God. The Holy Spirit helps us to remember the things we need as we are talking with others about Jesus or what we need for the various situations we face. So the word of God is important to us. Paul says it's profitable, and he lists four ways that it's profitable. Doctrine, or God's word, tells us what's right. Reproof, God's word, tells us what's wrong. Correction, God's word, tells us how to get right when we've gone astray. And instruction in righteousness, God's word, tells us how to stay right. And these are important points because they're profitable to us, beneficial to us as we read, as we learn, as we dig into the scriptures. So the first one is doctrine. And that's just teaching. Correct teaching is going to be helpful or profitable to us. You know, there's volumes of teaching that's out there, and most of it's not healthy for us. And many partake of it, and it weakens them spiritually. But the Word of God is healthy. It's sound doctrine. Agar in Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Wow. How can we understand, know God? That's what Agar is asking. By the word of God. How much of God's word is pure? He says every word of God is pure. You don't pick and choose what you like and don't like. And the word pure speaks of being tested, being refined in the fire. It's perfect. It's correct. It's inerrant. And David, in Psalm 19, verses 7 and 8, said, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The Hebrew word that David uses for perfect speaks of being without blemish. It's complete, it's full, without spot, undefiled. From Genesis, and I believe through Revelation, we have the inerrant words of God. And just to give you a couple of New Testament verses here, or New Testament verse, uh, Titus 2.1. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Healthy doctrine. Don't waste your time on things of no profit, but speak forth sound doctrine or healthy doctrine. Speak forth those things that will be beneficial to the people. Absolutely. Titus 1.9. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. You need that healthy doctrine in your life to stand strong, not the philosophies of the world. Sound doctrine. And it will bring conviction to those who are moving away from God, moving towards sin or false teaching, hopefully to bring them back. And the warning that Paul gives us here in 2 Timothy 4, 3, which we'll get to in a few weeks, are those who 
reject sound doctrine, move away from it. He says the time's going to come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They're not going to endure healthy doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Isn't that interesting? They're going to look for teachers that are going to tell them what? What they want to hear. Isn't that interesting? I, I, I don't want that conviction. I, I want to go to church and just feel happy. But conviction sometimes is part of it. Because God loves us. They don't want to hear sound doctrine, healthy doctrine. But they'll seek out those that will lead them astray. And here's the thing. Scripture is the divine plumb line by which every thought, principle, act, and belief is to be measured. You know, Paul told the Corinthian church what he had taught them, I believe, many times. We're, we are not like many, peddling the word of God, but as from sincerity, as from God, we speak in Christ in the sight of God. We have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Wow. Luke commended God-fearing Jews in Berea because they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. They checked out what Paul said to see if it was according to the scriptures. Yeah, how important that is. Everything needs to be measured against the word of God, not by experience or feelings or what others are saying, but by the word of God. Now, because of the importance of the scriptures, look at Acts chapter 20, verses 17 through 27. Paul is speaking to the Ephesian elders. And I want you to hear what he has to say. He says, starting in verse 17 of Acts 20, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you and taught to you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Why was he innocent of the blood of all men? Because he says, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I am so thankful that we are on our third time through the Bible, plus we've covered many, some 20-some in-depth studies on Sunday morning in the Scriptures. I'm the innocent. I'm innocent of the blood of everyone here, those listening on the radio or the internet, because I've taught you the scriptures. How, that's what a pastor is to do. I realize there's other things that I do, but that's the main thing. Why is this doctrine, though, so important? Because the next three points flow from correct teaching, the teaching of God's word. If you don't have that right, then the others aren't going to matter. What's the next one? Reproof. Doctrine or teaching tells us what's right, and reproof tells us what's wrong. Again, it's important. It's profitable. The Greek word for reproof carries with it the idea of conviction regarding misbehavior or false doctrine. Think about it. You know, I, I've had this happen to me. I'm dealing with some issues, and I'm really struggling with it, and I'm fighting. And I get in my car to come to church to, you know, Go to the post office, do the church stuff here. The pastor's teaching on that very subject. I'm like, really? Really? 
Come on. And I, you know, you can only fight it for so long. God's going to keep getting at you because you have to deal with this issue. That's the great thing about our God. You're confronted with sin. You're convicted now. What are you going to do with it? Well, you have two options. You can obey God and deal with it, or you can fight against it, and that's, you're not going to get nowhere. And if you reject what God is saying to you, what ends up happening many times is, well, you stop reading the Bible. Why? Because you don't want to hear it. You don't want to hear from God. You don't want those convictions. You stop going to church. You stop hanging around with Christian friends because you don't want that conviction. You want to feel good about living your life of, I guess, rebellion against what God has said. It's interesting because Jesus in John 3.20 put it like this. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. The Amplified Bible says, For every wrongdoer hates, loathes, detests the light, and will not come out into the light but shrinks from it, lest his works, his deeds, his activities, his conducts be exposed and reproved. Now, we like to apply that to the unsaved, and it's true. It does fit for them. But what about us? What about those who believe, who want to live in sin, and we then avoid the light because we don't want the light to expose our darkness. You know, the Bible will destroy or tear down those things that are sinful, those things that are false, but it builds us up. It all depends on what we do with it. You know, repent and get right with God or reject what God is saying and stay in sin. So God's word is profitable because it gives us doctrine or correct teaching. God's word is profitable because it gives to us reproof or it shows us what's wrong. Also, God's word is profitable because it gives to us correction. And, you know, we kind of touched on this already, but correction helps us to get back on track when we've gone astray. And I like the idea with the Greek word is the restoration of something back to its original and proper condition. In fact, in secular Greek literature, it was used to putting an object upright that had fallen down. Doesn't that fit us? We've fallen down in sin. All of a sudden, you know, you get God's word. God's word helps us to get back up and restores us to where we were at. I realize that we listen to a lot of people today and, you know, oh, God's a God of wrath and he's mean. You know what? God's a God of love. He does what he does because he loves us. And he's in the business of what? He's in the business of restoration. And he's really good at it. I'm not so good at it. He is. So when God exposes our sin and we come to see our sin, we get back up by repenting and returning to him. So doctrine's right teaching, reproof shows us what's wrong as compared to the uh, truth of God found in the word of God. Correction, how to get back up, and then instruction in righteousness. You know, once you know what's right, once you have corrected your error, you got to walk accordingly, right? Mm-hmm. And Peter said in 1 Peter 1, verses 23 through 25, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by word which by the gospel was preached to you. That's how we grow, how we walk accordingly, taking the word of God and fleeing those things that will hinder our walk or cause us to stumble. David in Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11, how can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. You know, David is saying, look, I take in God's word. And as I do, when I start going astray, his word causes me to get back on track. Now, did David always follow what the Lord said? No. We know his sin with with Bathsheba, the murder of her husband Uriah. 
one of his mighty men. And it took Nathan the prophet to come to him and share with him a story about a rich man that had a huge flock of sheep and a poor man that had one little ewe lamb. It was like a little kid, to, a little child to him. It was in his house. He fed the little lamb. And the rich man had someone come by and he wanted to feed him. So instead of taking from his own flock, he came and took this little ewe lamb from the man, slaughtered him, and they ate him. And David said, that man should be put to death. What's wrong with him? And Nathan said, you the man. <laughs> and David recognized, I've sinned against God. The conviction drew him back to repentance with God. We are to walk according to the high calling by which we've been called. And as we take in God's word, read it, study it, we then apply it to our life. You know, Paul spent three chapters in Ephesians talking about all that God has for us. And then from chapter 4 through chapter 6, he's talking about the high calling that we have, how we are to walk in faith. He said, in, starting in verse 1 of Ephesians 4, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. You know, Paul's saying, okay, I've taught you all that God has given you now. Okay, now walk accordingly. Okay? How important that is. But once we move away from the plumb line of God's word, our life is going to be crooked. It's going to be off. God keeps us in line. So we've seen that the Bible is from God. We've seen that the Bible is profitable to our lives and we'll close by looking at the end result in verse 17 here of 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is the result, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Why is this important to us? Well, first of all, God's word to the unbeliever brings them to saving faith. Think about that. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes, even to, as a believer, our faith is increased as we read God's word. But for the unbeliever, they hear God's word and they come to saving faith. They repent of their sins. But that's not what Paul is speaking about here. He says that the man of God may be complete in, here in 2 Timothy. As the word of God opened up to us by the spirit of God helps us to grow in our walk with God. Simple as that. You know, Paul warned the Colossians about the philosophies of the world, that they leave us empty in Christ. Well, or excuse me, leave us empty while in Christ we're complete. And that's what Paul's saying here. He said in Colossians 2, beware lest anyone cheat you. They're ripping you off through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Does God word, God's word make us complete? Absolutely. It equips us for service. That's for anyone, any child of God. You want to be in ministry? Know the word of God. Yeah, but I only clean the church. I don't care. Be in the Word of God. What if someone comes to the door while you're cleaning the church? Be, know the Word of God so you could share with them. What about your attitude? Man, these people at Calvary are so dirty, man. Look at what they, I got to clean this all up. No, that's a hard issue. Be in the Word of God. It will correct you. It will get you back in line. Do you see how important that is? And I think that's why Satan loves to lead pastors and people away from God's word because it's living and it's powerful and it transforms our lives. Look at our own lives. Look at what God has done in them. 
someone, several years ago, someone was complaining about sitting in church and hearing sermon after sermon after sermon, and they couldn't remember any of them. And then basically the point was, what's the point? I hear it over, I don't remember a single one. We spend way too much time being taught. Well, I personally think the opposite is true. We don't spend enough time being taught digging into the scriptures. But if you are kind of struggling with that, think about this. There was a critic who wrote a letter to a magazine, and this is what they said. This is pretty much what this person was saying. Over the years, I suppose, I've gone to church more than a thousand times, and I can't remember the specific content, content of even one sermon over those many years. What good was it to go to church a thousand times? Now, don't tell me you don't remember any of the sermons I've taught, but, that, you know, I understand. But next, the, next week, someone wrote in, and this is what they said. Over the past many years, I've eaten more than a thousand meals prepared by my wife. I can't remember the specific menu of any of those meals, but they nourished me along the way, and without them, I would be a much different man. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. You don't think God's word is working in your heart? Even if you don't remember it, that he can't bring it to remembrance when you're going through a situation? It's funny. Somewhat, sometimes people will come up to me and go, I, I heard this person teaching this, and they'll, they'll tell me what they heard. And I'm thinking, that was me. <laughs> but I don't tell them that. But it's just funny. They remembered the message. Praise God for that, because it's not about me, but it's just funny. The Bible will do its spiritual work in our lives if we allow it, and I think that's important. Now, I'll give you this story. It was written some 36 years ago, but I think it applies today. It goes, one of the most dramatic examples of the Bible's divine ability to transform men and women involved the famous mutiny on the bounty. I think we're all familiar with that. Following the rebellion against the notorious Captain Bly, nine mutineers, along with the Tahitian men and women who accompanied them, found their way to Pekaran Island, a tiny dot in the South Pacific, only two miles long and a mile wide. Ten years later, drink and fighting had left only one man alive, John Adams. Eleven women and 23 children made up the rest of the island's population. So far, this is a familiar story made famous in the book and motion picture. But the rest of the story is even more remarkable, and this is one we don't hear about. About this time, Adams came across the Bounty's Bible in the bottom of an old chest. He began to read it, and the divine power of God's word reached into the heart of that hardened murderer on a tiny volcanic speck in the vast Pacific Ocean and changed his life forever. The peace and love that Adams found in the Bible entirely replaced the old life of quarreling, brawling, and liquor. He began to teach the children from the Bible until every person on the island had experienced the same amazing change that he had found. God's word changes lives. Look at, I mean, we can look at the lives of the disciples and see how it changed their lives. We can look at our own lives and see what God has done in us. It's incredible if we really look at it and we say, thank you, Lord because I don't deserve any of it. We have to understand that the Bible is from God. We saw some of the evidence to show that the Bible was not written by man, but by the inspiration of God to man, and then it was given to us. And we'll keep looking at this Old Testament text next time and then the New Testament text. But it's not only from God, it's profitable to us. It helps us to know what's right, what's wrong, how to get right when we've gone astray, and how to stay right, stay on course. And the end result, it transforms our lives. And again, we're witnesses to that. And I understand there's a lot of pastors out there that put down the Word of God. You know, we, we, I watched the video of, on Super Bowl Sunday, one church service, they did a Super Bowl theme and they put the Bible on the floor and the pastor came and kicked it into the crowd. And that's what people think about the Bible. Think about those people in China that took it 
and treasured it to their heart because these were the words of God. That's the way we need to look at this. We can trust the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. We just need to apply it then to our lives. And I'll close with this. Again, this is from the scriptures we read this morning from 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. But this is from the Amplified Bible. Every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof, and conviction for, of sin, for correction of error and discipline and obedience, and for training in righteousness and holy living in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose, and action, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well-fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. May we believe it and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I can't imagine if we didn't have it, there'd be nothing to believe in. There is no hope. Look at what people put their hope in today and how disappointed they are. But when we place our hope in you, oh, it's real. And Lord, it, your word transforms our lives. We would not be the people we are today apart from you and your word. And we just ask that you would use the Holy Spirit in our lives to open up your word to, to us so we can grow in our walk with you. If there is anyone struggling here this morning, uh, listening on the radio, the internet, Lord, may you just open your word up to them and give you your peace, your comfort. For those that don't know you, Lord, may they understand all they need to do is say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Be Lord and Savior of my life. And you are a child of God. It's as simple as that. We make it so complicated, and it's not. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. And Lord, just keep us walking in line as you desire as we go through our life. We want to finish this race strong. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.